London, and you're listening to the special five-year anniversary edition of Speaking of Jung. Today marks the fifth anniversary of our first episode. In 2015, I flew from Chicago to Toronto to meet with Jungian analyst and the founder of Inner City Books, Daryl Sharp, who graciously agreed to be the first guest on a podcast I'd been wanting to start for many years. I'd first met Daryl 13 years earlier, when he spoke for two days at the Jung House in Columbus, Ohio, where I had been living at the time. The subject was his new book, Jungian Psychology Unplugged. You know, the one with the elephants on the cover? I'll always be grateful to the Jung Association of Central Ohio for hosting so many wonderful Jungian analysts who were also authors. Speaking of that, I will also be eternally grateful to Inner City Books for publishing the work exclusively of Jungian analysts. Inner City Books first introduced me to the brilliant writings of Marion Woodman, James Hollis, and Marie-Louise von Franz. Many of their authors have been my guests on this podcast. J. Gary Sparks, Frith Luton, the late father John Dorley, David Shane, Delden Ann McNeely, Graham Jackson, Maria Helena Mandukaro Guerra, James Hollis, Nathan Schwartz Salant, Stephen Foster, and Jan Bauer. Most of the 145 titles published by Inner City Books are still available, only a few are out of print. To purchase paperback copies, bundles, ebooks, and deluxe hardcover editions, please visit innercitybooks.net. They ship worldwide directly from their home office in Toronto. Because Speaking of Jung is an Amazon affiliate, most of our links are to Amazon.com, but all of the books are shipped directly from Inner City Books, so please order from whichever you prefer. Daryl passed away peacefully on October 8, 2019, surrounded by family and friends. Although he had recently retired, I was fortunate enough to record two episodes with him. The first, episode one, is about his first book, Inner City Books' first title, The Secret Raven, Conflict and Transformation in the Life of Franz Kafka. It was Daryl's dissertation at the Jung Institute in Zurich but we talked about a whole lot more. Honestly, it's my favorite episode. And my second visit with Daryl was to record episode five about his wildly popular book, Personality Types, Jung's Model of Typology. I hope you'll listen or re-listen to both of those episodes right after this one. Joining us today to honor our first guest, the late Daryl Sharp and his publishing house, Inner City Books, are his sons, Dave and Ben Sharp, senior editor and artist Victoria Cowan, general manager and resident drummer Scott Milligan, and Daryl's loving companion, Liz Jefferson. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com where you'll find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview was pre-recorded and posted on Wednesday, August 26th, 2020. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here today for speaking of Jung's fifth anniversary. And I'd like to start by introducing each of you so that the listeners will be familiar with your voice. And I thought we would start with Victoria Cowan. She is a senior editor for Inner City Books. And Victoria, would you introduce yourself and say a little bit about your experience? Thank you, Laura. Um, I started with Daryl's publishing company just a few years after he started it. Uh, I was working in the kind of corporate human resources life, and he was starting Inner City when he first came back from Zurich. And quite soon after, he was very active in the Young Society, and they had a big party, and I met him at that time, and we kind of partnered up. So, and I'd always had a background in psychology and in literature. So when he started the book company, sort of it was a natural in a way that I was very interested in reading and discussing all of this content. So that's kind of how I got involved. And when he needed uh, 
more participation than he could do by himself because it was going so well. Uh, he asked if I would kind of come on board as an editor, and I did almost all the editing for a long time, as well as the indexing, which we were chatting about before you called, about how much fun it is to do to index a book like that. Tell us what is involved. So that's kind with, of my background. Yeah, with the indexing, because Daryl did talk about that on the first episode, on episode one, that his early experience with indexing. So he taught you that how to was do with. That? Uh, well, I don't know how you teach something like that. I was thinking about that myself. Uh, I think you have to have a, a love for the material to do it in a way that uh, helps the reader. You know, if a reader is reading a book and they come across a term they don't know, the indexer should have known that could happen and would put it in the index, mm -hmm. as well as all the basics of the topic matter. Uh, I don't know how you learn something like that. That's a very good question, and I think I'll need a few weeks to answer it, to tell you the truth. You have to have a good command of language, obviously, and basic grammar and uh, really respond to the content. I mean, another indexer may have done it very differently. You know, it's always a personal voyage. So this was before computers, and the books were not digital, so you couldn't search for words that way. You were searching manually and then adding them to the index. Uh, yeah. Yes and no. We were on the edge of that. When uh, we were starting to put the books together with computer software, there was computer software that would index, but it was terrible. I mean, it basically took every proper noun, anything with a capital letter, and stuck it in alphabetical order. And indexing, you know, requires some content knowledge. So uh, we did it by hand, by core, by personal brain matter. Mm -hmm. So not only editing were you involved with, but also with the artwork and the book covers, right? Yes. Yes. A lot of them. A lot of them are my artwork. Yeah. Tell us about your background as an artist. Uh, I grew up in an artistic household, uh, but when I went to school, you know, to university, it was mainly literature and psychology. But then years later, I went back to my interest in the arts and actually went back to art school in my, I don't know, late 40s. Uh, so, and I've been, uh, you know, practicing artists and teaching um, ever since, though I sort of retired in the last couple of years from the teaching. Mm -hmm. So primarily in printmaking, which I think has the same appeal as indexing. <laughs> 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 and some of your art was chosen for the book covers. Yes. I would say chosen rather than uh, done for, if you know what I mean. It mm -hmm. was art that I was working on, and then it's abstracted enough the way I work that most of the imagery would work for almost any book. And maybe we'll get into some of the specific covers later. I'd like to now introduce... Dave Sharp, Daryl's eldest mm -hmm. son. Hi, Dave. Hello. I'm, I'm Dave. Hi, Laura. Great Hi. to be here. Would you tell us a little bit about growing up with Daryl, your, maybe not necessarily growing up with Daryl, but your involvement with Inner City Books <laughs> and Daryl? Well, when he started the company, I was living in an apartment right next door to him, which was very handy because uh, he was able to use half of uh, my apartment as uh, storage for the early days of of the book publishing business. So this was before the publishing company was headquartered in the house that it's in now? That's correct. It was in an apartment building north of uh, where Inner City Books is now. And at that time, um, I was only uh, 19. And uh, uh, because I was there and because I was able, I, I started with the um, packing of the books in the really early days. And I continued that as uh, Daryl moved into uh, the current uh, uh, house and uh, brought the business there. And uh, so I was, I was part of the early, early days of the book packing side of things. And I've always been uh, a natural with technology. So as we slowly became computerized, 
I was able to both benefit uh, from those computers coming into my life, but also uh, in turn was able to help Daryl with uh, things like um, editing the very first website for Inner City Books. And Ben? Yeah, I'm here, Laura. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. How many years are there between Dave and Ben? Uh, two. The age difference. There's two years. And so, Ben, where were you when this was going on, when it Daryl started the company in an apartment? I, I didn't actually, I didn't know about that. Yeah, well, that's, I was uh, 17 when Dave was 19, and uh, we would come in to visit my dad, uh, the three kids, and we'd go to that apartment and, you know, see it all in, in its early days. And then when we, when dad bought this house, uh, we moved it all into here. And then I moved into live with my dad in 1983, I think it was. And at that point, Dave went off to university and uh, I took over the rest of the book uh, packaging in the basement. And um, I did an awful lot of proofreading of the manuscripts that came through. Um, well, I was always um, sort of into English and, mm-hmm. and, words and grammar and so on. So I was, uh, it was kind of a natural for me. So for the next uh, four years or so, when I went to film school, I would um, work three or four days a week uh, fulfilling the orders uh, for my dad until uh, fourth year university, which got too much to do both. And at that point, I think I had uh, made a decision not to do it anymore. And I, I think Dave came back to finish some for a year before Scott got involved a little later. Scott, you've been with Inner City Books since what year? 1989. 89. So you came in just about 10 years after it started, and Daryl hired you to assist him? Basically, I was taking over for Dave because they needed someone to pack the books. At the time that this was happening, 89, I was a full time musician and working, you know, pretty much six, seven nights a week in Toronto. And I sort of just figured, you know, it's good to have something on the side. So this job came up, starts at 1 p.m. Can you imagine that? That's a perfect musician <laughs> job. <laughs> so, and I came in and interviewed with uh, with uh, Victoria and Daryl, and uh, I hadn't really known a lot about Young, although I did take a psychology course in college, so I knew a little bit. So it just sort of progressed as the you know I needed someone to pack up the books, and I I jumped at it, and it's sort of been it's sort of grown as you go on, as you know when when uh, as time goes on, you take on more responsibilities for inner city and. Uh, as, as Victoria um, retired and basically moved on, I took over her positions. I didn't, Daryl called me an editorial assistant. I wouldn't say I'm editing anything. It's a very nice term, but I would just say assistant. Right <laughs> arm. Yeah, I do, do a, you know, the jack of all trades around inner city books. I would <laughs> and when you say pack up the books for shipping? That's correct. Yeah, because they would be, we'd be sending books from all around the world, whether it's by UPS or by FedEx or you know, whoever else. So you there's a whole process to invoicing and then getting them off to the actual destinations. Okay. And since these are just introductions, I'm keeping them short, and then I'm going to go back to each of you. And lastly, we have Liz Jefferson. I am here. Hi. Hi. Uh, congrats, Laura. Five years. Thank you. I, I always say, and I'm going to say it again publicly, I don't think this podcast would exist without Liz's support and love and encouragement. So I want to thank you again for all of it and for making me feel so welcomed when I arrived there on your doorstep in 2015. I had met Daryl prior to that when he came to Columbus to give a lecture, but this was something different. So would you tell us a little bit about your involvement with Inner City Books? Oh, well, thanks for the kind words, first off, Laura, but you should know that that podcast is a a really valuable body of work, and you have nobody to uh, give credit to but yourself on that. Um, It was pretty exciting when you arrived here. (laughs) I remember uh, Daryl was like, well, who would ever want to ask me anything? I've put everything in my books. There's nothing more to tell. But it's... (laughs) That's very (laughs) Daryl. Yeah. It's nice being in the actual environment. I mean, I'm a fan like you. And when I first came to Alvin, I was like fangirling. It was like, oh, look, there's the elephant. Oh, look, there's the office where it all happens. So, Laura, we're in the dining room right now, and Dave's got it all set up for Skyping. But we're looking at 
all of Daryl's diplomas from all over the world and his, his Zurich diploma and the typewriter that he toted all over Europe. And it's just really nice, you know, to be back here and uh, see where it all happened. But um, I was the late arrival. I didn't arrive until 2013. And um, so I was really just like uh, a late arrival, but I could see that Daryl had found his dream team and he was just working with the people he loved on material he loved. And uh, it was a, a real gift and opportunity to be uh, able to watch that for the last six years. Yeah, I'm sure. So when I arrived in 2015, uh, we recorded the episode in Daryl's consulting room, which is it's kind of the, the living room, right? And Liz, when you said Alvin, that's kind of what you guys call the house because it's on Alvin Avenue in Toronto and it's a gorgeous Victorian house. So there on the first floor um, where Daryl did his consultations because he was in private practice as a Jungian analyst, there is his elephant collection. And I think we need to explain yeah. why there is an elephant collection. Who wants to take that one? Victoria will. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> you know, I was wondering about that one myself. I know that they were meaningful to him and everybody has always assumed, and I did it first too, that it was about the elephant being a symbol for memory. But I don't think that's the case. And I never got a clear answer. So does anybody else have any insight on that? Well, I, even from Laura's interview from Daryl, like uh, five years ago, he mentioned about finding it and finding the little, it's more synchronistic. Right. Right? It was a more of a synchronistic event. And that sort of wasn't really, I think he learned a lot about elephants, but I think it kind of, it just sort of pushed him in, in the what direction that he wanted without actually having these stereotypical things about elephants being involved. But if I had to guess, I'd say it's because for elephants, family is the most important thing. Mm. <laughs> and I don't know if you, mm. he always called himself, my life is an elephant and all that. But um, family was probably the most important thing to him. Some of the people in his family, he found outside of his family. But, you know, you knew if you were in the family with Daryl. Yes. And so the elephant collection is a result of people giving him little elephant trinkets, little elephant statues. And in it's in reference to this book. I'm holding it in my hand right now. It's the first book of Daryl's that I purchased. It was uh, actually at the lecture he gave in Columbus, Ohio in 2002. It was based on this book called Jungian Psychology Unplugged, My Life as an Elephant. <laughs> and there is a photo of two elephants on the cover and then a painting. Victoria, is that one of yours? I'm looking here. I don't think so. Oh, this I, is by I, Joyce Young. I was looking Young. for that book. Yes, and Joyce Young uh, is one of my oldest friends, uh -huh. originally trained in uh, biology uh, but also became an artist in about the same time. And she was a neighbor of mine. And we both did a lot of painting, discussion and planning and trying out things together. We're still very close friends. Um, and so that's the painting that he used for that particular book. Because she, uh, she may have done it with him in mind, actually. Oh, nice. And yes, in the beginning of this book, Daryl talks about Oh, uh, he was on a walk in the hills outside of Zurich, and he found a small ebony elephant. And when I arrived there uh, for our interview, I was really stunned to see that little elephant right there on the table mm. in between us, in between the two comfy chairs, the little elephant. And I believe I did, I might have a video of that on my YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So there is quite a collection of elephants on the mantle there in that room. And there's also a little statue from Edward Edinger's desk. Does anybody know more about that? Yeah, it was sent to Daryl after Edinger's death by his widow, Diane Cordick. I took photos of it and I think it might be in the video and that also is on my YouTube channel. So let's talk about the two. I heard Daryl say that 
these two people were his his favorite authors, Marie Louise von Franz and Edward Edinger. And Inner City Books has published a lot, if not all, of their titles. And they passed away in the same year, which was 1998. But before then, Daryl knew Marie Louise von Franz briefly um, from his time at the Jung Institute in Zurich. And she is the honorary patron of Inner City Books. So who would like to tell the story of her involvement? I can t- speak to a little bit of that uh, because I remember very clearly that that was the first author after his own uh, secret raving. It was the first author he wanted to publish. And he wrote to her. He was back in Toronto. She was still in Switzerland to ask if she would be an honorary patron, but also if he could publish some of her uh, material that had been presented primarily as lectures. So they, were, they weren't they were out there in print. Mm-hmm. And he felt it was an important thing to do for her to, thinking and to be available more broadly than just, you know, records in a, in a young society archive. Uh, so she agreed, and they had a very productive relationship over those years, because there's several of her books. Yes, I'm just wondering, had any of her books been published to that point, or were they mostly just her lectures being kind of mimeographed and handed out? I think there may have been, by the, you know, he published quite a few of them. I think by the time he was he had done a few. There may have been one in print. I'm thinking fairy tales, perhaps. And this is all vague memory, so mm-hmm. forgive me if it's completely yeah. wrong, if you do any research. Uh, but I think one of them, that one on fairy tales, had been, well, fairy tales was her prime sort of departure point for most things. But there was a specific book on fairy tales. And I think that was the one he may have seen published somewhere else. Mm-hmm. previously, and he got permission for. Yes, and he published her papers on alchemy. Liz? I was going to say, she had quite a number of books on things like creation myths and number and time and so forth that yep. were, uh, you know, they were academic publishings that she did through conventional trade or academic publishers. So that's why it was so important to have the lectures, because it, they're more conversational, they're much mm-hmm. more accessible. Uh, material, and people just didn't have access to them. So those were Daryl's specialty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what he particularly loved about her, is that conversational tone, uh, both in her lectures and in the way it came through in the writing. So Dave and Ben, were either of you involved with the first book that was published, um, which was Daryl's dissertation, right? It was... The Secret Mm -hmm. Raven, The Diaries of Franz Kafka. I love that book, and we discuss it at length in episode one. My quick answer is no. Mm -hmm. Uh, My is that I wasn't quite physically in the city at that point. And I was involved in in, uh, the cover of the third book, um, Divination (laughs) and Synchronicity. Um, But the first two, he, he did himself. I'm just wondering if when he published his thesis, which was the first title, if he knew that this was going to turn into a publishing company. Well, he didn't know that uh, he couldn't find someone to publish that book. Mm-hmm. So he just right. it himself. And that was the departure point to become inner city books. And I don't think that he was necessarily ever planning to become a publisher mm-hmm. in the way that he did. He was always planning to be an, an analyst. But then the book kind of went crazy and took off very quickly, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, Dave here, I would agree with that. The, the uh, first book was kind of an experiment and a way to uh, self-publish his own work that he cared deeply about. And um, as Ben said, the rest, the rest is history after that. But it, I don't think at that point he expected that it would grow into what it became. Mm. And that was in 1980, right? Correct. So Daryl did have a background in publishing. I was reading something that he wrote, which is 
well, it's titled now, Who is Daryl Sharp? And it's in the Speaking of Jung blog. I will provide a link to that in the show notes. And I had just read it through before we started uh, this recording and was reminded that he created his own magazine when he was 16 years old, when he was in school. So this didn't just come out of nowhere. Daryl studied math and physics and then he studied journalism, but he always had an interest in this, right? And he worked for a time for James Hillman. Who wants to talk about yep. that? Uh, all I remember about it is that uh, that was spring publications. In Dallas? So I think it's, no. yes. Was it in Dallas at the time? I think Daryl paid his way through part of his program in Zurich, working directly right. with the office there. Yeah. So in Zurich, before it moved to Dallas? I think so. Mm-hmm. We think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I wonder how he met James Hillman, how he got that gig. And wasn't Gary Sparks doing it too with him? That may have been later. He may have met Hillman through the Young Society in Zurich. James Hillman started Spring Publications and Daryl worked alongside him. He did the indexing. I remember him telling the story that everything was done. They they were printing physically. So each letter had to be set. And so if a word was italicized, you had to go and get the italic letter. So mm-hmm. it was painstaking work and, and very slow. So how did this evolve? I think, Liz, you asked Daryl during that episode, that first episode, how did you publish 140 titles? And he said something like one at a time. And (laughs) next thing you know, you've done 140. So what is the number now? 145? 145, yeah. Who would like to speak next about just kind of how, what was next? How did this evolve? Well, I think the next big epoch in the in the in inner cities when he published Marion Woodman's Owl was a Baker's Daughter, which I believe is the fourth title. Yeah. And that was Marion Woodman's thesis in Zurich. Yes. Right. And that that became a runaway bestseller, and that's what kind of um to me, I mean, because in those years and in, in the mid eighties. Um, when I was packing the books, those were always uh, The Pregnant Virgin and, and that one, the, the Baker's Daughter, were the books that were always in every single order they wanted that book. So um, There was also Addiction. Do you remember that, Ben? Addiction to Perfection? Because between the two of them, yeah. Addiction to Perfection was written between or published between those two titles. But to me, it was that it was because it's almost like um, – a filmmaker making a movie that just takes off and then they get, they make three more blockbusters. I mean, it was kind of in that way to become very successful very quickly. And that's that kind of inner city into this kind of, you know, powerful publishing company for, for, uh, for Jung. So addiction to perfection was the first inner city books title that I purchased. It was in 1998. I, I have it in my hands now and I'm looking, it was, published in 1982 mm-hmm. and the cover is the black cape a pen and ink drawing by Aubrey Beardsley um, this book I would you know that people say things have changed their life this book changed my life and I'm not the only one every time I've ever mentioned this book I get knowing mm-hmm. nods from other people who say the same <laughs> yeah. exact thing. This is one of the longer titles of yours. It's uh, a right around 200 pages and it's filled with artwork and images and dreams and words that I had never seen before and the Black Madonna and mythology and I... I, I, I didn't understand it when I first started reading it, and it took me years. But it has been the most, the single most powerful book, I would say, of my life. And it's what started my gratitude toward Daryl, toward all of you and this company for 
publishing these works that might not have been published by these big publishing houses that are just looking at the commercial appeal. So Mm -hmm. would any of you like to talk about Daryl's decision to only publish the works of Jungian analysts, which as far as I know, is the only publishing company in the world still that is exclusively publishing the work of Jungian analysts? Um, Um, I can answer a bit of that. Okay. Uh, From the beginning, that was his primary interest. He was never interested in publishing except as a way to promote the works of Jung and the ideas in the sort of the Jungian canon. It's Scott here. I found when I, in my chats with Daryl about some of that reasoning to uh, only use Jungian analysts was also just the, the knowledge of the uh, of Jung. I think, and a lot of times, I before mm-hmm. I even joined uh, Inner City Books, I actually had read a book. I think that wasn't it was a, it was from a Jungian standpoint, but it was actually a, not an analyst. And so when you go into something where an analyst has actually written it, you you I think it's much more in depth. Yes. And you get a little more. So there's a little a lot more meat involved, and I think that's why he sort of stuck to that that uh, criteria for Inner City. It was also very successful as it was, so he didn't need to branch out. And besides, he did get manuscripts all the time from people True. who yeah. weren't analysts I'm that sure. were or rejected just because you know. They may have been good books, but they were uh, not according to his mandate. He would also forward them on. He would actually tell the people, because we I remember him having manuscripts coming, and this is a great read, and I, he would recommend other publishers for them to actually knock on their door as opposed to us because our mandate doesn't suit them, which was you know, quite kind of him. You could just just say, no, here you go. <laughs> also, Daryl was quite the pragmatist. So from my perspective, um, uh, having this mandate and this mission was one way of of keeping the the his enterprise constrained, so it, it could be successful but not balloon to the point where it would become faceless. So mm-hmm. it it was able to continue to be personal, and for him, most importantly, for him to be able to manage it as one person. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, with help, but but you know, it, it didn't become a big corporation. So it, it, it retained that personal and customized approach to, to the choice of books to publish, how to publish them, all the editing that went into it, and, um, and the approach to the market as well. I want to talk about, for the listeners who are not familiar with Daryl's work, I've said this before and I'll say it again, he is my favorite writer. The way he writes, the way he explains Jung's concepts, I would like to mention again, Jung is not an easy read. And I even have had (laughs) analysts say that, which I enjoy hearing them say that. If it's not easy for them, then of course it's not easy for me. But Daryl takes Jung's work, Jung's writings, and he kind of sometimes storytells with it and drops it in and uses it and explains it in a way where it is digestible. And he even wrote a book called Digesting Young. And that's another thing I don't want to forget to mention. There are six inner city books titles, all by Daryl, that are provided for free at no cost. They're in PDF format, so they're downloadable. They're on the Inner City Books website, and I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. And there are two of them that are essential reading. One is, and everybody uses it, C.G. Jung Lexicon, a primer of terms Mm -hmm. and concepts. And the other is Digesting Jung, Food for the Journey. Those are, anytime anybody asks me, where do I start? I point them there. You can purchase the paperback editions, but they're also available free of charge. And Daryl, that was another inspiration where I was inspired by Daryl to sometimes just give stuff away because this is important and the world needs it. Let's talk about some of his other titles. What are some of your favorites? Hmm. Well, myself, uh, Scott, I, I preferred uh, uh, Survival Papers was one that actually I found 
there's great humor in there, and it actually, that's uh, the first book I read of Daryl's, and you see that, an interesting side of him. I have that right here. It is called The Survival Papers, Anatomy of a Midlife Crisis. And it is a very personal book, and it is necessary and required reading for anybody approaching midlife. Who else has a favorite? Well, you know, Laura, a lot of, the, of Dad's books, um, he sprinkles and peppers a lot of the stuff that we would do day-to-day -day life. Like when we go out for dinner, he'd talk about Mayday Malone's mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. stuff like that. And um, and what when you say he made everything so easy to digest, uh, the layperson could understand his uh, settings of like restaurants and with family and so on. And then he'd, you know, delve into some Jungian principle that applied to that particular setting. And that's what made it so easy for me to understand my dad's writings as well, because it was, uh, as you say, the Jung stuff gets very, very dense. And um, you end up putting it down and going, what the hell did I just read? Right. <laughs> but, exactly. Uh, it's just a... You could breeze through it. I'm mean, sort of breeze through it yep. um, because you could read. And I would often say when uh, talking about inner city books is that they're, and, and I didn't mean to minimize or diminish anything when I say that they are thin, manageable paperback books. They are chock full though of depth but they're manageable. And in the beginning, when I first became interested in Jung, I couldn't read Jung. And like I said, it's still difficult sometimes to read Jung. But these books, and these it's not that these books are easy. Some of them are quite difficult, um, but they are manageable and they are affordable and they are indispensable. So I want everybody to give me a favorite. So who hasn't? <laughs> Um, my favorite, uh, I would say, is personality types. Yes. Uh, and it's not yeah. one, one of the novel type books, but um, it was one that spoke to me uh, about personality types and a way of, of uh, assessing your own personality so that you can understand who you are in the world and how you interact with other people. And how how you can sort of define aspects of yourself that you might not understand, um, which I found very helpful at the time for myself personally, but also um, just as an easy read, uh, and, and and as Ben was saying, as an easy way of 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 accessing a Jungian thought and and Jung's uh, uh, principles. So. That is one of the other books that's available as a free download from innercitybooks.net. It's called Personality Types, and it is kind of maybe he had in mind Jung's volume six of the collected works, Psychological Types. He did, yeah. And we actually did a second episode together. Episode five was all about that book, Personality Types, where we talk about Jung's model of typology and... I made a trip to Zurich in late 2015, and Daryl, before I left, put me in touch with Barbara Davies. And I did an episode with her, recorded while I was in Zurich. And we opened that episode by me asking her, why do people clash? And she talked about typology. So one of the standout quotes by Daryl during that episode, episode five, is he said that he thinks the typology should be taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So who else? Who haven't we gotten a favorite from? Liz? Well, you know, I don't know if this is cheating, but I was very lucky uh, in that the Sharp family let me look at some of Daryl's writing when he was not a Jungian analyst. Mm. He wrote a really amazing short novel about, well, it wasn't a novel, it was a memoir. He wanted to do fictional memoirs. And it was a story about how he went from Toronto to San Francisco for an art show by one of his best loved friends, Jerry Pethick, whose art appears on a lot of the books. And it's a, uh, I think it's called the Fine Glow Papers. But anyway, you get a snapshot of Daryl as a young man before his directions set in. 
and um, the things he was interested in experiencing. And so it gives you an idea of the tremendous discipline that he brought uh, as when he went through the difficult process of being a Jungian analyst. It changed him a lot. Mm. And I wish people could see his earlier writings because um, they would know uh, so much more about the depth of his scholarship because he, uh, he wanted more than anything in life to be a writer. And then he ended up changing his vocation to being bringing young to people in writing because he really felt that um, social survival depended on people doing the work on themselves and yes. avoiding you know the cultural clashes and complexes that have people you know on other sides of lines and stuff so anyway um, my favorite piece of his writing hasn't been published and I just feel very lucky that you know I even got to look at it but um, they might see the light of day someday, who knows? Yeah, that sounds like what they're doing with some of Jung's work, which hasn't been published. Maybe this is a project for Inner City Books' future, I hope. Hint, hint. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that with us, Liz. I had no idea. And I do want to talk about uh, the artist that you mentioned, but d did we, are we leaving somebody out? Who else hasn't? Favorite book? Victoria, did you Sorry. give yours? Uh, you're talking about favorites still? Yes. I think <laughs> Daryl's books. I think yeah. for me, yeah, it's personality types because, <laughs> you know, I was uh, friends with a whole lot of people in the art community in particular, and very few of whom knew anything about Jung, but they did know about Daryl uh, as my partner at that time. So they often asked what these books were all about, and that was the one I pointed them to. Because what he did with Jungian thinking was make it so accessible to people from a wide range of interests and lifestyle. Yes. Liz, you mentioned the artist Jerry Pethick. Mm. And so his art has been used for some of the covers as well. Hey. Many. And when you walk into the front door of Daryl's home there uh, on Alvin Avenue, there's artwork all over the walls. Is some mm -hmm. of that Jerry's and some Victoria's? Yes. A lot. Yes. A lot. A lot of, yeah. So what is Daryl's relationship with Jerry? I'm just, I know there are other people who can talk more about it, but I just wanted to note that Daryl used to have the largest private collection of Pethick's work, uh, but he recently donated it to the um, Vancouver Art Gallery. And the Kamloops. Art and the Kamloops, Gallery. yeah, because that's where um, Gary, Jerry Pethick ended his uh, art career out on the West Coast. So Daryl knew him since his expat days in London, mm -hmm. and, and they were very, very close friends. And uh, there's all kinds of stories there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where did Jerry live and work? Many when they places. met? It was in England. London, England. He, Jerry moved around and... Yeah, he lived in a cave on Hornby Island at one point. Okay. But he, he was in London, he was in New England, he was in uh, San Francisco, but he ended up in British Columbia. He also had, had a home in, I, th I think, grew up in London, Ontario. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he started off in London, Ontario. And he's no longer with us? Yeah. No. Uh, his wife is still in the West Coast, as is his son with his wife and I think one child, if not more. I'm looking through some of these books here to find some of his work. So he and Daryl were friends and Daryl, did he commission him to do some book covers or he chose some of his work for the covers? He chose. I think he chose. Yeah. Yeah, so, Jerry, Jerry's work was, uh, he was also dad's drinking buddy and pool playing buddy. <laughs> okay. We, we would go out a lot, quite a bit and, and um, drink scotch and play snooker with uh, Jerry and uh, Bob Rogers. But uh, Jerry, Jerry's Pethick's work was uh, m not all, but a lot of it was on holography. And it was all very sort of um, abstract, kind of came out of the 60s and were very sort of, ethereal so i think that's what dad liked a lot about it and why it was on a lot of the covers 
And a lot of it was found objects like glassware he found at the dump on Hornby Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, one interesting thing is that was actually Daryl's first publication was a book on how to uh, create your own holography at home. And that book sold many copies. It sold all over the world. But Daryl wasn't even uh, in view of uh, inner city books at that time. So it was before inner city books. And would you tell the listeners and me, what is the word you used? Holography is a technology, as I understand it, which can be used to make holograms. So three-dimensional um, and Jerry, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, was a pioneer in, in experimenting with that kind of artistic technology. Uh, and Daryl, at the time, published a pamphlet, um, which was written by Jerry, about how to do that. Is that available anywhere, that pamphlet? Uh, for a price. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so people can, can contact you? Uh Perhaps yes. It 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 is out of print. Um, it was it was published by Daryl and distributed by Daryl uh, all through his home at the time. Well, that sounds like something that maybe needs to come back into print, and I think people would be interested in that. I know I would. It would be a period piece for sure, <laughs> um, but it was just really exciting because uh, he wanted a publisher very early on and a writer, and this was one thing he did with his friend that actually was very. Very influential. He sold a copy that probably every visual arts university program in the world. <laughs> yeah, there might be a market because he, Jerry, had uh, a major show at the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is one of the big national museums in Canada, and they would certainly want to see it if they don't already have it. Do any of you, for the listeners, know off the top of your head some of his book covers? Okay, I'll tell you three that I have sitting in front of me. One is The Middle Passage by James Hollis. And the other is The Big Sleep by Daryl. And the other is Dear Gladys by Daryl as well. Um, And I can add to that Living Young by Daryl. Looks like a bullet or a bee out there. Not The Big Sleep. What's the one that has the Venus of Willendorf rendered in wine bottles? Is oh, that's right, the big sleep. Right, right. That's the big sleep. That's oh, is it? No, no. I, I thought well, that the was... big sleep has a big figure, but I'm not sure it's the Venus of Willendorf. No, the big sleep is a is a male figure, but there is a. Right. I think there is one book cover that uses the the Venus. I'm I just. Looking. Dave just found it's on Staying Awake. That's one book in a trilogy that has a visual image of that um, sculpture. The Venus. Yeah, the Venus. But he would use crazy stuff like old TV screens or cathode ray tubes. He was very, uh, anything glass or metal or shiny, get, or natural objects too. I think his Actually. most important piece in British Columbia is called Time Top. And it was a yes. mess yes. that sunk in the bay or something, mm-hmm. and people could watch it rust. <laughs> <laughs> like it was an active living piece of time. It's worth noting that, that Daryl was a benefactor of Jerry's artwork. Yes. So he had a lot of it in his own home. And when you have art around you all the time, it's inspiring. Yes. And since Daryl is what was a publisher um he was inspired by what was around him and uh that artwork lives on in those publications Mm -hmm. i think in general that was a theme in his life that it's inspiration from the day-to-day from the practical and the ways in which the insights you gain from those things enrich come back to you and enrich your life Mm. While we're on the subject of art and book covers, there is a gargoyle on the front (laughs) porch of the house (laughs) whose feet are mangled, his front is crushed, he encountered a lawnmower, and his name is Arnold. I can feel you. (laughs) Please. Actually, I I bought the gargoyle for Daryl. Um, for I think a Christmas gift or something I can't remember and had a 
originally it was a, 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 a mama gargoyle and a little baby gargoyle on, on, the, on its leg. And it had a lantern and stuff. And I just thought it was kind of, uh, we both, we both like gargoyles a lot. He has a few around the house here and I have some on my own house. And what ended up happening was where it was, the snow plow during the winter pushed so much snow again, crushed the poor guy. <laughs> So it was God. a snow plow. Okay, I was wondering how a lawnmower could do that much damage. The snow yeah. plow. Yeah. So and, uh, and then but he was. kept it. He kept the gargoyle even after it got mangled. That's what's so intriguing well, about this story. His, uh, his, his son, uh, other son-in-law, Noel, actually put it together, which was actually really quite brilliant because it made actually it was still quite nice. Yes. You know? So. Mm -hmm. So we still have it around. I think it's still uh, I'm not sure who's going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly like it. So dibs. It's yours. <laughs> dibs. <laughs> Just <laughs> One of the other interesting stories that Daryl mentioned, um, maybe actually John Dorley told this story, but the Jungian analyst, Catholic priest, professor, mm. Father John Dorley, who passed away a couple years ago, knew Daryl, had met Daryl as a child. And then years later, they ran into each other at the Jung Institute in Zurich and trained together, right? Yeah. Father Dorley was a guest on this podcast in episode four. Who would like to tell that story? Because those two were close friends. That's the only part of the story we know, I think, is just how mm -hmm. cool is that? Go fishing with a kid and then 30 or 40 or more years later you are training in a very esoteric discipline in another country it's just unbelievable at a small institute yeah yeah i don't know any more details than that except that they were another pair of people that you know there are a few friends in daryl's life that are super super important and father dorley was certainly one of them and inner city books published four of his titles i I had not heard of him when uh, he was su re recommended, suggested that I do an episode with him. And when I mentioned that I was going to have Father Dorley on the podcast, so many people said, oh, I love his books and were very excited about it. And at the time, the material was way over my head. I had a very difficult time with yeah. it. It's extremely um, heavy and dense and was a struggle for me, but he was very patient and kind. And we did an episode together. I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. And we focused on his book, The Illness That We Are, a Jungian interpretation of Christianity. And are any of you big readers of his or did any of you know him personally? But I met him a few times, and I think most people did in this group. In in passing only. Yeah, we didn't have a lot to do with him. He lived in car, in Ottawa. He lived in Ottawa, so yeah, yeah we he would come and visit. Yeah, we're here. Yeah, yeah, he would come for a lodge of meetings. He would stay in the guest room. And they'd get up to mischief and, uh, <laughs> you know, good Nonsense. times. That's yeah. so funny. He was a priest. But he's also a Jungian analyst, and I just want to correct myself. The subtitle of the illness that we are is a Jungian critique of Christianity. So what an interesting combination to be a Roman Catholic priest and a Jungian analyst and friends with Daryl. Uh, I love it. <laughs> if you listen to Daryl tell, he'll tell you, I don't know if that's fair or not, but he, he will tell you he... Doctor or Father Dorley stayed on the DL quite a bit because he was always skirting excommunication. Yeah, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but I think he tread a very interesting line. And and he never was. He lived it out successfully. Uh, Daryl took a very short video of Father Dorley there at the house in the kitchen and sent it to me because. At the time when I would do an episode, I wanted a photo of the person and I wanted a photo mm -hmm. that hadn't been used before. I wanted something different, something unique. And there were no recent photo photos of Father Dorley. And so Daryl managed to take one with somebody's iPhone. And then this maybe 
two and a half, three second video of Father Dorley exclaiming, yeah, he's got it when he was able to su successfully take the photo. So that's actually on my YouTube channel because where else are you going to see that? Oh, I did want to ask about the Inner City Books logo, the original logo, which is sort of ornate. And who designed that? Daryl. Isn't it a collaboration between... Um, uh, I thought... I no, thought, I think... The, who's that, Ben? Uh, I can't hear. It's Dave here. I have a note to myself that Fraser Boa That's helped it. him design oh, this. Okay. Oh, well, that's possible. He helped him design it. And then it did it become modernized into the one that we see at the top of the website today? I don't think so. My my memory my memory is that it was basically drawn on paper with a cup, uh, you know, uh, with a pencil drawing around the circumference of a cup and then uh, joining lines, you know, going through the center of the of the circle and a big square around it. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that eventually became electronic. Um, but the logo has not, has not changed since the beginning. And it's a basic uh, sort of Jungian archetypal shape, you know, like all the parts had some kind of meaning. And Daryl designed that specifically. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, is there a stained glass window or piece upstairs yep. in the office yep. with that logo? Yes, it's not stained glass. It's all clear uh, with some of it with different textures. And I had that made for him as a gift. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. So you mentioned Fraser Boa, and I have in my notes to talk about the Canadian Mafia, which uh. consisted of... <laughs> Fraser Boa, these are all Jungian analysts, and, and they were called that at the Jung Institute in Zurich. They were the Canadians that were training at the same time. Fraser Boa, who is the brother of Marion Woodman, Daryl, right. and then was Father Dorley part of the Mafia too? Hmm. So was it the four of them? I think he was later. I, I think I'm, he was sir, a little, maybe a little after. Before my time, Victoria, you're going to have to handle that. Yeah, one. they were staggered in their <laughs> different. Yeah. I think. I think there was an overlap, but I don't think he, I think it was primarily Fraser Marion and uh, Daryl that got that name. Were Daryl and Fraser close? I don't know much about Fraser Boa because he passed away quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they were. Uh, yes, I think they were. Yeah. Thick as thieves. <laughs> and w was Fraser an author as well? He worked in film more than writing, really. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. He did the film on Von Franz. Oh, yeah, that's very important, Victoria. That's right. Von Franz is uh, um, his supervising Trinidad. analyst. Yeah. So he yeah. filmed her for the series The Wisdom of the Dream, right? The Way, way, the way of the Dream. The Way yeah. of the Dream. I had seen that, but it was quite some time ago, and was it... Marion Wood, oh, sorry, Marie Louise von Franz, lecturing, speaking. Do any of you recall? Was Daryl part of that at all? I think uh, no, but there was interviews primarily rather than her lecturing. Okay. I don't think. Uh, I mean, Daryl and Fraser were very close, so they were certainly always in talking about that. But I don't think that. Daryl had a particular role in that film series. Do you know anything, Liz? Um, I think Daryl may have contributed to the production of it in a tangible way, but I think it was mostly Frazier's creative work. And interesting trivia, didn't Frazier um, used to write for Albie Yost when Albie Yost did Saturday Night at the Movies? <laughs> <laughs> Very <that's> likely. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. I think you're right. Yeah, he was a big film background, and it's hard to get that that film now. I don't know if something's happened with the rights to it or not, but uh, I haven't seen it myself, and I'd like to. The Way of the Dream? Um, yeah, and as Victoria says, um, I think Marie-Louise von Franz only agreed to do it if the dreamers would tell the dreams in their own words. And, you yes. know, 
media impact as opposed to lecturing or recounting that the dreams voices, uh, dreamers voices had to be front and center in that. And from what I recall, it's in multiple parts. It isn't just a one hour, one or two hour movie. This is a very lengthy series. That's correct. I don't know very lengthy, but it's more than one part for sure. I think okay. three or four. Mm-hmm. Dave here. I have a memory of my my father in England, uh, yeah. where we lived and where uh, myself and uh, uh, my brother and one of my sisters was born. Um, we lived in Sussex, south of London, and uh, in a, a 17th century cottage, which had an old uh, garden shed. And that was the first office for Daryl, with whatever um, manual typewriter he had at the time. And he did his early um, writing there, uh, away from the family with two or three kids at the time. So that was in 1962 or three. And that was well before he went to the Jung Institute to train. So you... Dave and Ben were, how old were you when Daryl went off to train a, a, to become a Jungian analyst? So he, you didn't grow up with him as an analyst. He became an analyst later in life. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure the year was 1971 that he went to Zurich or 72. It's, it's kind of fuzzy because he, we were in Burlington as a family and then he moved to Toronto for a year and then he went to Zurich. So, uh, the exact time is a little fuzzy, but uh, yeah, I was 11 when he left, and um, my entire teen years, and he wasn't around in terms of uh, until I was like 18 that he was an analyst in my life. From what I remember, he, he was accepted as a trainee at the institute, but he had to wait a year until there was actually a space for him. So he had to kind of hang out for a year before he could go to Zurich to train. That mm-hmm. is correct. I believe he was in London at the time. He also worked with the Playwrights Co-op, which I think was here in Toronto. Yeah. Publishing plays, scripts of plays that had been shown, probably Canadian authors primarily, that mm-hmm. had been shown around Toronto. But it was publishing, again, that he was involved with. Yeah. But he yes. also went to London, England. Part of the way he got the foot down in London was uh, he was scouting for venues to promote Canadian playwrights overseas. So he actually was kind of a part of the cultural scene in Canada, but you don't really hear too much about that. But he used to read manuscripts for uh, Canadian publishers. He used to teach at universities around here. He, um, he was the first director of the Playwrights Co-op when it was founded. So, you know, he, uh, he had a cultural life before he, he went away. Mm-hmm. And when he came back from Zurich as an analyst, he was one of the first Jungian analysts in Canada, wasn't he? Yes. He and Fraser and Marion. Yeah. They came back sort of together, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's when they founded the Institute in Toronto. The Institute in Toronto. And he had a thriving practice right away from what I remember. So Mm -hmm. He did. even though Jungian analysis was not that well known, he was able to build a practice and a successful one. Well, wasn't it like they were just waiting for them? Like we, we've seen a letter from the, uh, there was a Jung foundation for lay people and they would try to get Jung's ideas out to a, a population in Toronto. And they circulated a letter saying, look, we have real Jungian analysts now that you can consult for, you know, they may come and lecture for us and, and, you know, we've got the real deal here now instead of, you know, sort of compiling information in an academic way, you, you have access to real analysts. It was almost like the, the scene kind of exploded at that point because there was so much interest in Jung at the time. And there was a very good run of public lectures and, and events around uh, bringing lectures to the public. And uh, I think Daryl was a big part of that. Mm-hmm. That's the first time I saw him was when he was giving a lecture um, oh, t- for the Young Society in Toronto. I want to hear that story, Victoria. Yeah. So uh, do I. Well, Ed, I went to a lecture and I was very impressed with his 
sort of down to earthness. I've been taking a course, a writing course at U of T in continuing education uh, that had a section on memoir and bi- biography or something. I forget now what it was. But the instructor of that course uh, was the one who said that the Jung Society had this series of lectures and they were very interesting. I think she may actually have been one of his first analysis in Toronto. So I took myself off to that party in the middle of a snowstorm, and that's where I actually met him face to face. And as they say, the rest was history. <laughs> well, it, was it was it was just a lovely meeting and a lovely mm-hmm. evening. Mm-hmm. So Daryl passed away last year, and I don't know if all of the listeners know that, but he he died peacefully and he was surrounded by his family and friends and inner city books lives on. So what's in store? What's next? I think we're just continuing on as, as the, uh, uh, to promote the the books that we have at some point down the road. Um, the plan is we might, publish another, another book. Uh, it all depends on what crosses the, the desk. At this time, it's kind of, uh, we're just uh, trying to get into the, uh, into his big chair, as you would say, you know, and it's, so it's a little daunting, you know, um, myself taking over inner city is, uh, I have the, the business side of it down. I'm not necessarily an analyst by any means, but I think I have the concept of, of keeping it true, uh, as he would, uh, as you go forward. So I think that's the plan is to, is to keep going as we, as it is. And there's a legacy there that, that continues and the interest is still there and the company will continue as long as, as long as both those are are alive. And are you accepting uh, book submissions at this time? Not at this time. Yeah, we're still, uh, that's still a little bit early for us to, to jump on that. But like I said, at some point, we may open that up again. Well, you've certainly been wonderful about supporting the the mission of our inner city books. Um, Laura, we can't thank you enough for all of those, you know, things that you've done to keep the company in the in the social media world. Mm-hmm. Well, it's meant a lot to me um, more than I could ever express. I just wanted to mention my how I first became introduced. I I I'm sure it was because I purchased Addiction to Perfection by Marion Woodman in 1998 at the recommendation of my analyst. I was in analysis at the time. But also there was a newsletter that you guys would send out, a paper, a physical paper newsletter called Jung at Heart. And yes. you have them archived, uh, I think since 2003, they're available on your website, innercitybooks.net, and they're filled with book reviews and book excerpts and this kind of news about what you're publishing and about analysts. And at some point, you stopped sending paper versions and they were just in email format. And so they would come from Daryl himself. And so... I would get an email and it said it was from Daryl Sharp. And I'd be like, oh my God, I got an email yeah. from Daryl Sharp. And yeah. it was the newsletter. And so it was, oh, it was, oh, it felt very personal. And so sometimes I would write to him and ask him a question and he would always respond. And I always appreciated that. So I think I may have even mentioned this in the first episode is that I would keep, I always carry a big purse with me, a big bag, just in case, you know, there's everything in there. (laughs) And I have a plastic folder and I would keep those young at heart newsletters in my bag in case I needed something to read. This was before smartphones that, I mean, I have Jung's entire collected works on my iPhone. (laughs) This was before then. (laughs) So I would have these paper inner city books newsletters in there and I would sometimes pull them out and read them. And I know I still have them somewhere, but like I said, they're archived online on your website. And um, I, I feel indebted to inner city books because of my love for the material, the accessibility of the books, the affordability, 
how brilliantly they're done they are and i will always always be grateful and um it's one of the reasons why i started this podcast when i was living in columbus ohio the jung center there the jung association of central ohio brought daryl in as a speaker as i said in 2002 and um the, they brought in other speakers as well other inner city books authors like james hollis and so yeah it's my biggest influence and like i said i'll always be grateful <clears throat> I would like to just thank you for giving us the chance to share all of this memory material with each other as, and with whomever ends up listening to it. It's been really a lovely experience. So thanks a lot. Laura. Well, I'm very glad that you're with us here, Victoria. Thank you so much for being part of it. You're yeah. welcome. It's really great to be able to hear other stories and uh, share what we know and remember about Daryl and and Inner City Books. And speaking of websites, um, the Inner City Books website is undergoing a transformation and should have a, a launch in uh, early September. Oh, wonderful. As soon as that's ready, I will tweet that out and put a link to it on Speaking of Young's front page. Because like I said, this is very important to me and very emotional and has been very fulfilling and um, just have a deep love for all of you and all of the work that you've done in in sharing the work of Jungian analysts with the world, which we are so desperately in need of right now. And I will help in any way I can because it means so much. Make nope. sure you visit us again. Yeah. Uh, we should yes. close with Daryl's mantra since his legacy is... What did he always say? Stop me if I'm wrong. I think of the two he always told me, but he always said, follow your energy where it goes and do the work that's right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. And live your nonsense. <laughs> and live, and live your nonsense. nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Please visit the website, Speaking of Young, that's J U N G. Dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungian Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or tune in. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to everyone at Inner City Books, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to the special five-year anniversary edition of Speaking of Jung. <laughs>